Welcome to the Shabby Detective, yet another Columbo podcast. I'm your host, Mike White. Joining me is Mr. Chris Dashu. You know, Nashville and Carnegie Hall don't mix. Also along for the ride this week, our very first special guest, it is Mr. Richard Haddam. Would you like some of my raisins? Right, what was up with that? He comes prepared. He's like a Boy Scout. They're probably very warm. <laughs> They've been in my pocket. They're real warm and soft. Columbo's nasty pockets deep with raisins. At least they were in the box. Just pulls out a handful of raisins. Want some of my raisins? Oh, pretty soon we're going to get some hard-boiled eggs, but we'll, we'll talk about that next season, I think. We are talking about the seventh proper episode of the first season of Columbo. It is called Blueprint for Murder. It originally aired February 9th, 1972, from a story by William Kelly, written by Stephen Bochco, directed by the one and only Mr. Peter Falk. Apparently, he called in his buddies John Cassavetti and uh, little Stevie Spielberg. Got some pointers from these guys. Still wet behind the ears. He was just probably about to make that, that horrific second episode of The Night Gallery. I mean, he'd already done an episode of Columbo. That's why I called him up, said, hey, Stephen, can you help an old pro? I'm usually an actor, but I really, you know, I threw my weight around. I got this directing gig. They gave me this script that they knew would be really hard for me to shoot because it's almost all outdoors at a construction site where it was currently being built. So you never had the same shot twice. I want nothing more than to than to harsh on Peter Falk's directing, but I really can't. I, I thought it was a well-directed episode. I thought it was very well-directed. I thought the audio sucked a lot of the times. Oh, my God in heaven. Thank goodness for subtitles. It's hard to hear. Mr. Markham. Mr. Markham. Like, Jesus. Come, like, who, how did this get through? Uh, mix it up more? I don't even know. Like, it's. I just think it was... I, look, you know, the setting of where this was episode was set is really unique, but I do not think it added to the ease of the quality of the audio just based on them filming in a fucking basin, essentially. For the uneducated listener, let's let's give them the the, the rundown. Shall I? You you guys want to Please, go ahead, right ahead, Richard? You, you're taking the reins. I love it. There's an architect played by Patrick O'Neill. Thank you. And we see him in conflict with Forrest Tucker, who has quite a reputation in Hollywood for having the biggest one, second only to Milton Berle. You know how I like to talk about this stuff. I wondered how many minutes into this broadcast we would be before Forrest Tucker's massive organ came out. By that, I mean his harmonica. Forrest Tucker is murdered by an architect. So the, these are both a big architect developer kind of guys. And Columbo comes in to investigate. So as Chris was alluding to, much of the episode takes place sort of at the foundational construction site, the big pit in the ground of a high rise in Los Angeles. And we're down there with the hard hat guys and the dust being kicked up by the big, you know, earth movers and stuff like that. And then the question is, will Columbo be able to prove that this guy did murder someone because for much of the story, there is no body. It's just the presumption is that either disappeared or met with foul play. And there are advocates and detractors on both sides. And it actually takes a little while. Frankly, it takes to the very end when Columbo finally figures out a way, as he always does, to make the bad guy tip his hand. It's a pretty clever twist. We'll get to it when we get to it. But anyway, we're in the world of big skyscraper construction. That's sort of the visual theme of the episode. It's very cool. And we bought a company that makes models of companies is all I can think of when there's the Williamson Tower model that Forrest Tucker comes in and just knocks all over the place. I love the opening of this episode with the car arriving Forrest Tucker's feet, and we just watch him march into this office. Sir, you can't go in there. And fuck this. He just comes in, starts laying into everything. Elliot Markham, what a piece of shit you are. I've been out of town. You're coming in here. You got my wife paying for this ridiculous thing. And you're probably trying to sleep with her, too, if you haven't slept with her already. It's wonderfully clear. By the way, um, they're both great. Those two guys, 
And and you mentioned his name, and I've already forgotten his name, but it's St. Clair? Patrick O'Neill. I don't know why I keep thinking his name is St. Clair. Patrick O'Neill. I'm writing it down, and I know it because I know that guy. He is great. I really like him. He's he's halfway between like just a normal leading man and somebody more sinister. Like he he's not obvious in either direction. So he's perfect casting. Yeah. And he worked from what I remember a few times with Woody Allen. I want to say that he was an Alice. And then I think I mostly know him from a movie that you probably talked about, Chris, Under Siege. I was about to say he's in Under Siege. <laughs> he's in the original Under Siege. The original one, Richard, not yeah, the one Yeah, not that Richard wrote. Haddam and Matt Reeves is Under Siege too. I've never seen Under Siege, so I wouldn't know. Patrick O'Neill's great in this, right? I like him. He kind of, it's, he's almost presaging the type of villain that Patrick McGowan will play in the next season. This very erudite, I know he's not British, but it feels like he's almost European or something. This whole like thing. George Hamilton. Oh yeah. But he's, he's very, very into his classical music and just, he's much more cultured than everyone else, especially this hillbilly who's got all this money that I should really have because I'm such a brilliant architect. Well, and he has a really interesting sort of speech pattern. He sort of talks very fast and very low. It sort of he sort of talks like this, you know, and, and the, the words kind of run together. And it's not oratorical at all. It's disarming in its almost casualness, which I thought was interesting because, you know, you say the thing about being British. I look at his face and I'm like, I'm expecting a British accent out of this guy. And instead, we don't get that at all. So it was I was when he was on screen, I was riveted to what he was doing, interested in everything he did. He did a great job. I just now I'm just waiting to hear how much he hated Peter Falk. As far as I know, they got along. This was a very stressful time for Falk doing this directing and acting. And depends on what source you read. Some people say that Falk was like, no, I didn't give that great of a performance because I was too busy acting. And then other sources will say, oh yeah, I felt very liberated and I was able to do a great job acting as well as directing. So just your, your mileage may vary as far as what your sources say he was up to with this. But yeah, I thought that he handled it very well. My only, I can't even call it a complaint. I just wish there was more Forrest Tucker, but he looms large over this whole episode because he does have such a big personality and he just comes in and is just a whole cowboy hat and all this kind of stuff. And I love that the hat plays a role later on in the episode. His whole thing with the country music obviously plays a major part of this. So you feel that his presence is throughout this episode, even though he's missing, quote unquote, before 12 minutes are even over with in the episode, this was a very early appearance by Columbo compared to some of the other episodes that we've seen. And Columbo coming to the dig site and this dedication and stuff, it's a little odd because this is a missing persons case at this point. It isn't a murder. Right. And But he is called in because Mrs. Williamson. Yeah. Oh, my Lord in heaven. What a wig, huh? What a wig, right? She's awesome. Yeah, Janice Page is great, but what a wig on her. My God, like it had a mind of its own. Especially when it, she had the uh, pigtails in. Yeah, it's like, what is going on? But it is weird because he's almost at the beginning playing the role of a private investigator. Because I don't know if you can just go get a lieutenant at the LAPD to personally investigate a case because you are convinced that there's foul play, even though there's so many clues early on that suggest, look, he might just be out on his own. His car was found at the airport. He is very, very wealthy. He travels the world. He was in Europe. Oh, I love that. I love the fact that in 1972, he had, he had just arrived back from Europe. He'd been there for two months. There was no way anyone could get in touch with him. Right. It's amazing. This episode couldn't exist in 2022. It's like the whole premise exists because no cell phones, no way of easily nailing somebody down. Also, his cars at the airport. Well, when he have had to have bought a ticket, well, he might have flown under a different name. What? <laughs> yeah, like that, like that, right? 
I'm pretty sure when Brad Pitt goes to the airport, Brad Pitt's at the airport. He doesn't have a choice, even if he wanted to. Exactly. Though I know you can like change your name up a little bit. I had a actually somebody that we're talking about before we got on the air, a friend of mine, Robbie Thompson. He has to go by like Robert Thompson when he goes to the airport because there's a Robbie Thompson that's on the no fly list. So all the oh yeah. So what they told him was like, I'll just use Robert next time. No problems now. Let this be a lesson to you, terrorists. All you have to do is like change your name just a little bit. There you go. Bobby Bin Laden. I couldn't fly under any other name. You know, you could. Nobody. None of us could. Especially not internationally. (laughs) Could you then? Oh, God, Chris, you could get on an airplane. You could be flying. You know, that whole thing with like, you know, you get on the Zeppelin in World War II and and, uh, Indiana Jones comes up to you and asks you for your tickets. That stuff would happen on airplanes. Like I was watching movies and like people would get on an airplane and then be like, uh, you know, one ticket, please. And they would like pay for the ticket on the flight. I never experienced that. Mike, I don't know. You and I are a little bit closer in age. I'm older than you. But you could, I know that up into the 80s and early 90s, I have clear memories of just arriving at the airport 10 minutes before my flight was going to take off and just like you just ran in. I mean, there were plenty of like sitcom 90s movies that had people running to the gate. How many movies and sitcoms have we watched where you go up to the ticket counter and buy the ticket right there? How much is it for a ticket to Utah? You literally, or, or, or like romantic comedies or other movies where, remember in the 90s, it was like, I don't know if I saw this in a movie or if I wrote it in a spec, but it was, it was like this game where people would take dollar, a dollar bill out of their pocket or, or a bill of some sort and look at the last digits in the serial number. And then whatever flight that was, that's where they had to go. And then they just would just walk, then just go, oh, that's the flight I'm taking. And five minutes later, they're on an airplane flying. It's just, no big deal at all. It was like getting into a cab. I'm not surprised you could travel under a fake name. You know, just blase they are about it. He could just have traveled. I was like, fuck, no, he couldn't have. I mean, how hot is that? Like, I was thinking, so they can't check any sort of passenger manifest whatsoever for they probably couldn't. You know, they could probably look across some of them and be like, is there a name that sounds like Bo Williamson? I've heard people say, recently in political discussions it's like one guy put something in the heel of his shoe once it didn't work and and now literally ten thousand people a day for years are taking their fucking shoes off but no matter how many thousands of people are killed by guns we can't inconvenience the gun owners (laughs) can't ask anything of them but in another situation Everyone, certainly in America, if not the world, yeah, we responded. And you know what? It's worked so far. I mean, it's insanity, frankly. And again, it's it's just like there's things about this episode where it's like, whoa, it just puts it back into perspective. Like, like look, John Fiedler's in this episode. Oh, oh boy. Yes. I didn't I'm even mention so that. Happy. I was like, why is he even here? And that he's a doctor, too. I was just friends like- with Peter Falk, I'm assuming. I guess. Well, there's that whole thing about, you know, Bo can't go too far because he's got this bad ticker and he's got an appointment with John Fiedler to get a um, his heart looked at. So he goes to to Williamson's doctor. I'm just asking why John Fiedler's in this episode, because he's such a really well-known character actor in one scene. Why not? I don't know. I'm just saying I, I would just assume like Peter Falk was like, hey, John, you want to come and be on the Columbo episode I'm directing? The logic was completely different. Casting logic was different. Casting logic, you know, up until the last 20, 25 years was there's certain actors who always play that role and you you instantly accept them. So that's why we love him as Gordy the Ghoul. We love him on Bob Newhart as, you know, Mr. Peterson. And we love him here. We see him and we automatically know who he's going to be, what he's going to be like, what strata of no one was like, why are we casting him? We've already seen him a million times and do this role a million times. Like, no, that's why we're doing it. That's why we love him. But here's what I'm going to point out about that scene for, for the listeners who are going to watch the episode or have. Look at that doctor's office. It's just a bunch of equipment against two giant 
dark paneled walls. I guarantee they shot that in a corner of architect's office. And they're just like, look, we need to shoot this somewhere, clear out the desk and, and, and a couple of those globes and stuff and just put in a table and some medical looking stuff. I had never seen a doctor's office that has just looked like a little bit of shit in a giant 40 foot tall paneled. It's insane. It's cheap, but it works. I know that it's cheap because I, I sort of know what they did. But it doesn't look cheap. It actually looks like the rest of the show, which is, and a little bit of Colombo I've seen. I haven't seen the, like the last six probably that you guys have gone through. I, I've I've seen the the TV movies. I think one of the reasons people like watching them and and like watching them still is the production value. It's never some heroin dealer in an alley. It's always people at the top of a very long elevator ride in carpeted offices with statues and wet bars. Who doesn't want to see that? You know, you know, normally we are watching some rich asshole take a fall that he deserves. Elliot Markham, the Patrick O'Neill character, not necessarily that much of the, you know, it's really. Bo, that is the one that's making the fat cash, but I think it's because Elliot is, he's greedy and he's doing this. And I think that's one of the reasons why we kind of root against him. And also because he really thinks he's so much smarter than Columbo. And obviously, you know, Columbo just like, oh, that's really interesting. This whole thing about the pyramids and building and, and burying the architects and all this. And he's just like, he basically is like, here, let me use this as a stick. And like, I'm almost wondering if he's the one that's giving Elliot Markham the idea. I know he's not. I know Markham's already got the idea, but like, he's almost like playing into it right then. Well, he wants him to do it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Elliot Markham wants him to dig up that column. But I like that it's Columbo that brings it up first. No, but it's like Columbo also is like, like you said, he's trying to like push him in that direction. Yeah, it's great. He's already like so many steps ahead ahead of Elliot Markham. Like in chess, he would already like have his whole end game planned out. The twist or the yeah, kind of the concept of the episode is that Columbo begins to build a theory. And the theory is that Elliot Markham has killed his development partner, Forrest Tucker. And they haven't found the body yet, but it's like, oh, this building is being built. He's going to, or just has, put the body in in one of these piles, which is the you know, the main support towers, and and so the body got thrown in, covered in cement, covered in whatever, and that body will never ever be found, and and it's it's a little back and forth. You sort of watch Columbo put this all together, but at the same time, Markham says, "I know what you think I did," like. Okay, for the past you know hour of this episode, you're everywhere that I go. You keep asking questions. Clearly, you suspect me of murder, and and now because you happen to walk in on my lecture about the pyramids, now you're asking around about the construction, and you think I buried him, and I, you know this is ridiculous. And then Colin was like, "So, well, are are you saying you won't mind if I have it dug up?" And it's like, well, that'll be super expensive and really, you know, time consuming and problematic and everything, you know, but hey, you're the cop, do whatever you got to do. And so, and so again, for the viewer, it's like, oh, he's daring Columbo not to go to the trouble of all of this. But then Columbo does go to the trouble in a very well-directed sequence that makes is really fun and funny about standing in line at, at a government Right, he's like, "Oh, go to room three sixteen." He stands in line. Oh, you've got to get this permit signed over in room three twenty. Another line, and it's one of those things they do in movies, and I never know how they pull it off. But it's like they make something boring funny without making it boring, and they did it here very well. And they just the frustration on his face, just the demoralization every time he sees another line. It's one of the only times we see Columbo look defeated. I feel like you got to give Peter Falk credit for how well a lot of this is directed. And there are people that have directed this show less competently that are, you know, that are directors. My fear was 
that his performance was just going to be over the top and out of control. And it did, it did, you know, border on the, okay, we're getting a little cutesy, the, the raisins and you want to have a candy bar, you know, and all that stuff. But when did he say that in the same scene, the candy bar, first he offers him raisins. Then he offers him a candy bar later in the scene. Mike, you remember this, right? Not offhand, but I believe that it happened. Go back and watch it because the guy keeps talking about, I've got dinner plans. I'm a very hungry architect. I'm sorry, Mr. Colombo. I've got to go. And he's like, well, you want my candy bar? And it's just like, was that on the page or was that his little, you know, curly cue? On Bulky and raisin? flourish. It was a little weird. Yeah, you can see that he's really getting into the eccentricities of the character now. Yeah, I mean, that whole thing, too, of like Fielder saying you should stop smoking and then Columbo throwing away the cigar at the very end. And I'm just like a whole thing where he's like, it's too good of a prop. I have to have it back for next season. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess the question is, is could this have been the way the show ended? It could have been. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the way I looked at it. I was like, is this the way the show could have been in an alternate universe? This is how the show ended. Every time we get to the end of one of these seasons, Chris, we're going to talk about this because there this are so is where many it could times, have ended. Yeah, there are so many times where you're just like, yeah, this could have been the final Columbo episode. And so like that little thing, him throwing away the cigar, that's one of those moments. And then there are some that are even more pronounced where you're just like, this feels like the end of Columbo. And then when he comes back, it's a little bit of a miracle. But do they address it? No, no. Okay. So I don't expect him to, obviously. It's don't- just a matter of... With Falk in his negotiations for pay and all that kind of stuff. Sure, it was. sure, sure. What's interesting, though, is that this wasn't the last episode that was filmed. It was actually last month's episode, Short Fuse, was the last one filmed. This one was filmed right before that. There's a finality to this episode that feels weird at the end. Because, like, the guy even gets away. This is almost like the Raiders of the Lost Ark of, of Columbo. Because, like, all he had to do was just wait there at the end. It's like he didn't have to do anything else. Well, it's very uh, death lends a hand to me. Yeah, it's like it's very convenient. He's like, well, it was the music, really. And it's like, uh, I wish there was maybe a little more than that. Yeah, you kind of want more of a case being built up rather than it was just you happen to leave the radio on the wrong channel. Is it just that Peter Falk or Columbo? just knows he just knows he's like i always get the feeling in these episodes it's like i meet a character i meet another character but at a certain point i meet a character and i'm like okay they're guilty i don't know how i just i'll figure it out along the way but i know they're guilty and now it's just a matter of me revealing it somehow the best colombo episodes make it seem less like that's the case until it it's it's more subtle than this. This episode's not very subtle. I think some of the better episodes this season, given that this is the last episode of this season, we'll have to talk about the season at some point. The best episodes of this season of the show have made it very subtle. And it's kind of like not wink wink, but like a little bit of a like, oh, like you can like you see he's here's this and this. But then some of them are like, bam, whack you over the head. It's like baby's first Columbo. And this episode is, this episode really is like verging on that in a lot of ways with what the, like you said, Richard, the cutesy twist is very cutesy. The way Columbo catches him is like, I just, that's not a case, dude. That's a, that's a coincidence. Like that's just a coincidence. Well, he, his theory just happens to be exactly correct, which is, you're baiting me to look in a particular place. And so I'm going to go to a lot of time and trouble to do that. And it's, it will reveal nothing. Now, why would you go to all that trouble? Oh, because we'll never look in the same place twice. So now so you, you have think. a free. So you think, so now you've got a free and clear place. Now, frankly, all they had to do was follow him and they could have made the arrest at the place where he went and retrieved the body. But instead, that's what I thought they were going to do. No, but instead it has to be, it needs the thematic unity of you have proven my theory by coming back to the spot where we thought you were going to bury it. Only now you're burying him now, thereby proving the theory in a more visually thematic and conclusive way. So, okay, great, fine. But boy, I mean, I guess Columbo just gets to tell the LAPD, 
all right, guys, here's what we're doing. We're going to we're going very expensive wild goose chase. It's only going to cost taxpayers, you know, about $100,000 based on my hunch. In, instead of just following this dude or even just searching, or even if we think he murdered someone, just search his home and the places he goes. And, and the places he owns? Like his fucking stables? Or with the most, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Since when did the LAPD become like the Miami PD from fucking Dexter? All of a sudden, they're the most inept dipshits. This, I don't get it. It's like, this is where Columbo's just God mode. He's just, I just knew it all along. Like, I knew it. I knew it. It's like, oh, like that's lazy, Botchko. Of all the people. But there's nothing about this show. Like, this show does not hang its hat on police procedural in any sort of real, let's not Adam 12, let's put it that way. Okay. It sort of has to own that because they show us a, a more accurate procedural works better if you don't know who the criminal is, because now you're on the side of the cop and you're watching to see if our system works. And then, and you find out it does that's, and every week you're like, well, God bless America. This show, by not doing that, makes it all about character. It's like, okay, well, we're going to tell you who did it. So the only enjoyment you could possibly get out of this show is watching whoever we cast as the lead, and he better be fucking charismatic, because we already know the end of the story. So all we're watching is him figure it out and catch him. And Peter Falk does that. And I'll say something else that I didn't think about before, but tell me if you guys agree. There's something weirdly formidable about Peter Falk. Weirdly? Oh, he's formidable as fuck. It's his eyes. It's the look. It's his just stare. He stares through you. He doesn't look at you. He stares through you. Are you, are you making a remark about his false eye? No, I'm making a remark about the way he looks at everybody in the show. He looks through them. The, the full the glass eye. We were like 12 episodes into this show. Ain't nobody going to be making up glass eye jokes. You know, he's not tall, he's not strong, you know, he's not aggressive, but he is weirdly tenacious. And like, like when you're watching, always get the feeling, I would not want this person on my case. And that's great. The show is very literary in its presentation. I mean, and the, the framing device is literary. I mean, this would feel right at home in a book. And that's why I like this show so much. Because of the framing device of the how catch him as opposed to the who done it. Because it's asking more of the actors in the show, at least the lead. Because again, this is Columbo is in a lot of ways the villain of each episode. The way the best versions of this show are told is you are not following Columbo. You're kind of following Columbo, but Columbo's just appearing and wreaking kind of havoc on the villain who you more or less follow almost the entire episode. Because we meet the criminal first, we're in uneasy alliance with them as a form of protagonist. And then and then it's like, oh shit, here comes Columbo. Oh God. Now it's just a matter of waiting for the house of cards to come down. Have you guys ever talked about, have you ever done the fantasy game of if for whatever reason it wasn't Peter Falk, have you thought who else would be Columbo? At the time? Darren McGavin. What would he have been like? I mean, it could have been interesting. I think th I don't think the roles are too dissimilar. I don't think they ask for I don't think they ask for different things. They're both kind of gruff and standoffish. Kolchak a little bit more than Columbo. McGavin sort of a, is a big actor. I think he's he's like bigger and he 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 likes to he likes to be louder, that's for sure. I mean, at least it's Kolchak. Oh, I, I guess that's I don't know. I I just I don't know. What about like George Papard or Brian Keith? Well, I don't know. Papard. Isn't Papard Banachek? He doesn't work for me. Yeah, he's Banachek and he just, he's too fucking smarmy. There's a reason why we're not talking about Banachek on this episode. Too fucking smarmy. And I mean, I kind of, I guess I could see Brian Keith, but he's too, he's too Aldo Ray-ish to me sometimes, or he's just like, he seems like a big lug a lot of times. I know like he can be subtle, but it just feels like he's too big as well. And I like that the shabby detective, I love that Falk is small, one-eyed, hair all over the place. Like once he gets past those pilots where like that, especially that first one where he's so like buttoned down, little tie and everything. I mean, once he gets over that, that's why he 
disconcerts you. And that's why I think he, him on your case would be a bad thing. Who's Columbo today? Who do we who do we cast out of today's act? Tony Shalhoub. Uh Mark Ruffalo. Oh, Monk. Mark, Mark Ruffalo. Mark Fuck. Ruffalo. Fucking Mark Ruffalo. Oh my God. Yeah. He's even got he, he's even got kind of the like frumpy shit down like perfectly. Yeah. I loved him in Zo. He was so good as Ta as Toski in Zodiac. There you go, baby. Right there. Somebody propositioned that Natasha Leone would be an interesting Columbo. And I'm like, I can kind of see that. She has the delivery down. Yeah, well, especially in Russian Doll, where she's basically an old Jewish man. I've never seen it. Makes me want to watch it now. Oh, she, <laughs> that's her thing, man. She is being an old Jewish man in that. Yeah, Mark Ruffalo would be great as Columbo. My God. I mean, I don't want to see that. Just fucking Zodiac. Like, just watch Zodiac. He's kind of doing it there. Like, Even better, watch Now You See Me. Remember the uh, Jesse Eisenberg, we're all magicians, like we're rogue magicians. Ruffalo is in one of them. It might be the second one. Now you don't. Yeah, it should have been. Instead of now you see me too. It should have been. No, you don't. Would have been a better title. Probably would have been a better movie too. Ruffalo does play a cop who's trying to figure things out, but these magicians are running circles around him. Until the end, when you realize, oh wait, no, he's he's got a whole backstory we don't know. That's about. the first one. That's the first one. I I like Mark Ruffalo. He's great. I don't know. Like the thing is with Peter Falk, like it's it got to the point where they can't re really remake Columbo because Columbo got contemporary. It's <laughs> almost Columbo became contemporary eventually. I mean, they could reboot him, but you would have to acknowledge, like at some point, you'd have to go. I'm sorry, does this Lieutenant Columbo just have carte blanche at the uh, LAPD? Is he is he even affiliated with the LAPD or is he with Interpol? Like, why is he just allowed to set up big situations and things? They've kind of already done this because they have had situations like this where they even tried to take Columbo off of the case. And I'm thinking specifically, well, there was the very first episode, but I'm thinking very much specifically of suitable for framing. When the captain's there and he's just like, the criminal's talking to the captain and he's just like, you know, why is this man still here? Da, 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 da. And then Columbus just like, basically is like, step aside, captain. You know, like the captain's like, okay, yeah, it's his case. You know, you take it over. Isn't Death Lens a Hand similar? I mean, you already said it, but at the end of Death Lens a Hand, it's like they do the fucking trap, do you gotcha thing. And they do that here. I was honestly surprised that they didn't do at the end of this episode. What I would have done is I would have let his ass pull that body out and start dragging it to the thing. And then you pop all the lights on and Columbo's just sitting there like that. I mean, like it was kind of anticlimactic, even. He you just see the lights pan over Columbo and it's like. Man, like that's it. And it's like, hey, asshole, I see you there. It's like it doesn't it doesn't have that moment of gotcha, which I don't think the show needs it, but when it pulls it off, it really works. Especially like the suitable for framing, like you said, Mike. Patrick O'Neill is just like so nonplussed by the whole thing. <laughs> He's like, whatever, you got me. You're right. He's probably the most nonplussed of any criminal I can remember seeing, even more so than like some of the ones from future seasons, like Ruth Gordon or even Donald Pleasance, where Pleasance is just like, you can see the resolve on his face. But with Elliot Markham, he's just like, yeah, OK, yeah. He just like walks over to the police car and gets in. And he's like, he sits oh. in and then there's just like a shot of his like face in like a tiny little window. And it's like, what is going on? He seemed fine with it. He's like, no, whatever. Okay, I'll have to cancel my dinner reservations. That you know, this conviction will never sit. Yeah, yeah. Like that's the other thing about Col these Columbo episodes. Like, I would love to know. You know, that would be a good show. Just take every Columbo episode and do it from the LAPD, like the, the lawyers' perspective, where they're trying to process all these people, and like, <laughs> and there's no like half of them are just like, oh, this was entrapment. Yeah, you're free to go. We've said it already. Like, I don't know how much of this is like above board, my friend. Like, I mean, look, he's no Jack Reacher. He's not just saying, yeah, I'm just going to go fucking kill them. Goodbye. But I mean, a Columbo, there is a level of carte blanche to the Columbo character that is shared with more contemporary, quote, detectives, unquote. 
Well, even classic. I don't know how many convictions Poirot would have gotten either, you know, or even Sherlock Holmes. There's so much like, oh, you mean it was these people with red hair? Wait, what? But again, this is so contemporary in LAPD. It's like, you know, yeah, it's it's just funny because like I think about it, it's like, no, some of these people were just like, I got a really good attorney and they were fucking circumstantial evidence. <laughs> this this is the LAPD that would give us Mark Furman. So we're not above planting evidence. Is there an equivalent to Columbo like set in sort of old Japan where once once our detective reveals the criminal, every episode ends with that person just committing suicide? They should. That would be great. They just the, the cop is just standing there watching the guy just eviscerate. <laughs> just himself fucking do it. <laughs> just gut All yourself, right, bro. So, it's like, hey, that was lunch. really weird. <laughs> Time for lunch. It's like, all right, yeah. So we actually have found some Japanese Columbo episodes, but they are more contemporary. And Chris actually threw some Japanese Columbo in the Dropbox for us. There was Ooh. also a detective named Furuhata Ninsaburo, I believe it is, from mid-90s. I have or had, they were on a drive that melted down, all of them subtitled, and apparently he is supposed to be very much like the Japanese Columbo. No, like, trench coat, that kind of stuff, but just like this, you know, the the way that he was always waiting for the criminals to to slip up kind of thing omnipresent i don't i don't know how to describe colombo because in this episode it feels like he's the author of the story this is the first episode where i'm like this is mighty convenient like yeah and then even that gag with the cop and the car i didn't realize that that was a recycled thing from murder by the book that bachko was like "Ooh, i want this to happen and then used it again in this one because it was cut out of the original what what was it? What was the, the, gag? Ga- the gag at the end where the cop pulls it, the, his tire blows and then the cop pulls him as the cops behind him and the cops like, let me help you pop the trunk, man. That felt weird because, yeah, it didn't work. It felt like it was out of a different episode. Almost. It felt like it should have been at the beginning of the episode when he went to hide the body. Yeah. Well, we never see him murder anybody, which is also weird. But the weird thing about that scene, which I thought was executed fine i mean it was it's it's like placed it, weird think about what it does to the audience it, it creates all this tension you're afraid he's gonna get caught like again suddenly we're in his point of view and and i think in a weird way we're like no he's got to get caught by Columbo. don't catch him now we gotta wait a minute so Columbo can catch him I mean, to be fair, yeah. I honestly, like, I didn't know how this episode was going to end. I assumed it would end back at the dig site. And I was like, is this going to end with him getting caught by a cop? Like, this is fucking strange. Suddenly he pulls out a gun and shoots the cop. It's like, wow, this Columbo just got really dark. That's what I was waiting for. I was expecting him to follow him. And like when he was putting the body in the trunk of the car, because there's a shot where you can kind of see the front of the car. I was expecting him to like close it and Columbo would just be standing there like. Meh. Well, yeah, they make such a big deal of that stupid horse and stuff. I was just like, does this have anything to do with anything? And then finally it's like, oh, he was keeping the body at the horse ranch. Oh, OK. The, the notion that he would kill that motorcycle cop. It's the 11th hour. I can't. I'll throw both bodies into the pit. I think that was the tension of the scene because I'm like, I don't see any other way out of this. This guy's gone too far and he's too big an asshole to just lose to a motorcycle cop. Like when he loses to Columbo, it's almost like, all right, all right, game knows game. I'll give you this one, Columbo, but this one only. But it's like, but not, I am not going to get arrested by that. I'm in motorcycle uniformed LAPD officer. No way. Yeah, if the fucking the tires flat, get your tow truck and get you to fix it. All right, sure. Okay, bye. Yeah, I it was a very strange scene. It worked. It's just like I by the end of the episode, I was like, just get to the end of the episode. Cause like I think I know where this is going. And it goes exactly there. It goes to him uh, with the body at the dig site, about to dump it. I mean, that's a good hiding spot. I wonder how many bodies have been hidden that way. If the mob traditionally operated in construction and invested in construction as we feel or know that they have also garbage collection. You're like, well, 
landfills and you know construction and construction sites. yeah well they've done i think they've done a bunch of stuff with hoffa's body like looking for it in buildings with like the concrete echolocation stuff so hey if you believe that netflix movie and i know you guys have already talked about it but i think every season just ended with everyone thinking and hoping it was over and then it just never was <laughs> just never ever 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 was which is funny that this is now another show we've talked about where the lead actor was like, I'm kind of don't want to keep doing this. But at least Darren McGavin was like, I kind of don't want to keep doing this. And we're not going to. <laughs> I mean, also, it got canceled, too, right? Well, well, did Peter Falk want to stop doing it or was he or he just wanted to take over? Well, a little bit of both. He didn't want to work in the TV system. That was the whole thing. He thought he was making little Cassavetes movies and they're like, we're not making a fucking Casavetti's movies. You you got seven days. Go film the episode and deliver a product we can use, or you're in breach of contract. Which I guess he figured out a way to do. I mean, I know the story is that this episode was, you know, he, he was handed this one to scare him off or to trip him up. You know, the script was a grenade they were throwing in his path, hoping that it would stop him, but it didn't. Just the notion that to NBC, I guess, that it was just like. Nope, it's our most popular show. So we'll spend any amount of money and we'll do whatever we have to do. He has to come back. And it's just like, oh shit. I can't remember who it was, but it was either NBC or Universal. It was just like, hey, yeah, we'll pick up the overruns too. Oh, probably. Oh, no, it was Universal for sure. Well, wait a second. No, 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 wait. No, no. I think you're right. No, you, the studio would have said, no, we have a budget for this show. And then it was probably NBC that's like, we need something on Sunday night. So we'll, we'll, you, you guys make the episode. Tell us how much extra it costs. We'll pay for it. Get it on TV. It's worth it to us. Advertisers love Columbo. We're getting the right demographic. Everybody loves Peter Falk. It's valuable to us. Just please keep making the show. And they've done the bare minimum of episodes. Eight. That's like the least you could do. I mean, good God. Well, is that because it was on the wheel? It was like, well, next week. It's but that's, but that's why... Sure, that's one of the reasons Peter Falk did it, because he was like, I only have to do eight of these. He originally was just slotted for seven. Remember, they made him do an extra just because I think that was like they somehow twisted it around to be like, oh, yeah, you want to direct. We need this extra one, too. Oh, OK. Yeah, so that can be yours. All right. I was going to ask you, Mike, you know, since you and I have watched this first season together, what was your favorite and least favorite episode of the season? Uh, I mean, I'm always going to be a sucker for suitable for framing. I know we talked about some of the problems that that episode has, but just that fucking ending is so fantastic. But I have to say murder by the book is probably the best episode of this whole season. Agree. 100% murder by the book is they came out swinging with the show, you know, the movies, different story, but I mean the show murder. Yeah. It's just amazing. Jack Cassidy, the author. Directed by Senior Spielbergo. That's a great episode. And I, I think probably my least favorite episode, I don't think it's this one, but it might be suitable for, no, it's a dead weight. I mean, that episode's not great. <laughs> it's dead weight for me as well. That's yeah. the one that if it comes on, I might not rewatch it. Whereas with any other episode, I'm rewatching it. Yeah, that one's not great. Eddie Albert is a creepy guy. Even though it's got bird in it. R.I.P. Bert. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's painful for me. I really wanted Bert here this whole time. Yep, and you're never going to see him again. Chopping up that goddamn lettuce in heaven. How about you, Richard? Well, I haven't seen all the episodes of the season, so I will say that the one that I just watched is my favorite, <laughs> and I have no non-favorites. Non-favorite. I like that. I have. This is the way Richard talks about his children. I have one favorite and no non-favorites. You know, my, my children, I rank by who I hate the most down to who I hate the least on any given day. And I will often let them know. I'm like, come here. Let me give you a hug. Today, I hate you the least. You give them hugs? Physical contact? Wow. They usually call him the great Santini. Usually, it's a basketball to the face. It's like, <laughs> you going to cry? You going to cry? You going to squirt some out there, huh, pal? That man is my hero. I would give anything to parent like that. I, my two older boys, they let me give them a hug. They're perfectly. It's Dashel right now. I can't, I have to sneak up on him. And, and he thinks it's funny, but if I come at him, he's like, I'll scream, I'll scream. And when I, and when I go in for the hug, 
he emits the most ear piercing scream. It literally sounds like I'm murdering a coyote. What's going on over there? The Haddam household again. They got a coyote problem. Or what the fuck is going on in their backyard? <laughs> He's hitting that kid again. He's hitting him again. So, Chris, what is going on with you these days, sir? Over at cstashu.com, you can find all the things that I work on. The Culture Cast, Scary Stories We Tell, Ranking on Bass with these two fine gentlemen, which we do all the time. Sometimes. And uh, yeah, all the other weird stuff over at cstashu.com. That's where you can go to find me. What about you, Richard? What's going on with you? Working hard on season four of HBO Max's Titans. You can find the first three seasons on HBO Max right now, and season four will premiere before the end of 2022 on HBO Max. As for me, you can always find me over at the Projection Booth, where we've got links to The Life and Times of Captain Barney Miller, Dreams for Sale podcast that Chris and I and Father Malone do. Eventually, I'll put up some links to Midnight Viewing, which is the Night Gallery podcast that we do. So all kinds of good stuff over there. We will be back next month where we will be kicking off season two of Columbo with the episode Etude in Black, directed by Coach from Cheers and starring the one and only John Cassavetes, Peter Falk's good friend. So we get to see how that happens. You are in for a treat, ladies and gentlemen, and we will see you then. Please rate and review the show wherever you get it. Thanks so much to John Walker for our opening theme song and Colin Gallagher for our closing theme song. And we'll see you next month. 